Now it should work. There you go. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 12. It's a wonderful time of the year as we go toward Easter. And uh, we want to think this morning as we work up toward Easter Sunday next week a little more about the resurrection. And this morning I want us to think together for a few minutes about the importance of the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. Now last week, if you uh, watched the message or you were here, we talked about the validity of the resurrection. We talked about how authentic it was and how important it was. And let me just remind you of three things very quickly that we learned last week as we move into this morning's thoughts. Number one, we learned last week of the essentialness of the of the resurrection to the gospel. In other words, we learned last week that without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no atonement for sin. There's no pardon for sin. And so really, uh, the, the validity of the, of the resurrection is without Jesus coming literally, bodily, out of the grave, uh, there would be no gospel to preach. There would be no victory over death. There would be no victory, no hope, really, for us or anyone. So we are thankful that we learned last week of the, of the essential nature of the resurrection to the gospel and to the validity of the gospel. And then we learned last week that the resurrection of Christ was according to prophecy. It was according to Scripture. In other words, in the Old Testament, the resurrection of Christ was foretold. And Jesus himself in the New Testament, when he was talking to his own disciples, he forewarned them that he would die on the cross and rise again the third day. In fact, Matthew 16, 21, listen to what Jesus said. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. So we, we find that it's essential to the gospel and we find that it was prophesied in the fulfillment of scripture. And then finally, um, we discovered last week that the resurrection was verified, if you will, by witnesses, by those who saw Jesus when he arose from the grave. You'll remember there's a whole list of people, and we won't uh, belabor the point on all of them, but you'll remember the women saw Jesus initially. They went there first on that resurrection morning to honor him and to anoint his body and found that he was not there. And then Jesus appeared to some of them in his resurrection body, and then Jesus went to Peter uh, the first of the apostles, and what grace there is in that, we don't have time to talk about it, but Peter, the one who had denied him, Jesus went and lovingly restored him uh, and met with him and, and encouraged him and forgave him, and certainly Peter restored the ministry. And then, of course, the disciples in the upper room, Jesus was seen of above 500 people at one time. Uh, he was seen by James, his half-brother, and then Paul himself said, and me, one uh, born out of time, saw Jesus. Uh, Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, and Paul was saved that day. So we have all these eyewitnesses that, that validate the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, I would sum up last week's message as we move into this week with this, with this observation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most verifiable event in human history. It is, it is that thing which is authenticated and verified above all else. And listen, Jesus is the only one who's ever come out of the grave. He's the only one who's ever resurrected from the dead. And so the validity of the, of the resurrection of Christ is fully and beyond doubt established. So this morning I want us to think about, about how important it is. The resurrection is part of our faith, is part of the gospel. In our passage this morning, beginning in verse 12, it really is a continuation from last week. Paul deals with some false teachers. Some false teachers had come into Corinth perhaps they were Gnostics. We're not sure exactly who they were. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the fact is, these false teachers had come into the, into the church and had sowed doubt about the resurrection of Christ, about the physical, literal resurrection of Christ. And Paul deals with that in a very interesting way here. In the first part of the passage we're going to read in verses 12 to 19, what Paul does is he says, okay, Let's, let's think about it from your perspective. If you deny the physical resurrection of Christ, what's the result of that? What is the end of that? And so he walks them in that false doctrine to its, to its logical conclusion, which is hopelessness, which is being lost and, 
and, and, and the inability to be saved. And so in this passage, Paul walks them through that thought process. So look at it with me, beginning in verse 12. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, there were people in the church who were teaching that there was no such thing as a physical resurrection. So Paul just begins there. He says, if you, if you deny there's a general ability for a physical resurrection, then we have a problem. And he goes on to talk about that problem. Look at verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. That's the logical conclusion. And then what's the implication of that? We'll look at verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable or pitiable. Do you see what Paul did there? He said, if that's the way you want to think, think about where that goes. Think about what it leads to. He said, if there is, no, just think about what he said here very quickly. He said, if there is no general resurrection, according to your premise, then Jesus could not have resurrected from the dead. If that's your view. Now, who's saying these things? Well, we don't know exactly who these false teachers were. Some think they were Gnostics, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a, is a, was a first century religion slash philosophy that said salvation came through a special knowledge. Funny, they seem to be the only ones that have the special knowledge, right? And so it was this Gnostic view, and, and even, they've even been called, some, some theologians have called these Corinthians the Corinthian Sadducees. Because in, in Egypt, in, I mean, in, in Israel, uh, Sadducees were a, uh, a leadership sect slash religious sect of the Jewish faith who didn't believe in a physical resurrection. They thought when you were dead, you were just dead. And so that, that false Greek philosophy and that false uh, Judaic philosophy had infiltrated the church. And so Paul is addressing that thing. And, he, and, and listen, Paul was a master apologist. He could take somebody and say, look, if, you, if that's the way you think, think about where that goes. Think about how you end up and think about how that applies to what we know. And, and listen, one of the reasons Paul was a master apologist is he knew, the, he knew the Bible front and back. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. And he could take uh, the truth and apply it to their life and to, and to their philosophy. And he did that here. Now think about what he said. He said, number one, if, if according to your view there's no resurrection, then preaching is empty. It's powerless. And what does he mean powerless? It means that the gospel and the preaching has no ability to change people's lives. It has no ability to do anything if Jesus didn't raised from the dead. If Jesus didn't come out of the grave on the third day, there's no power in the gospel. There's no purpose in Christianity. So Paul said it leaves you in this state of hopelessness to not have the resurrection if you claim no one can be raised from the dead. That would mean for us today if that were true, and it's not. Paul simply going along their philosophy. It would mean for 2,000 years, men have been faithfully preaching the gospel for nothing if there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection that we celebrate next Sunday morning, the resurrection of our Savior, without that resurrection, we waste our time and we waste our efforts and there is there's nothing really to preach. You understand this. When preachers preach, when men stand up and say, thus says the Lord, it's the power of God's word that makes a difference in people's lives, not the men who are preaching it. Amen. And so if there is no resurrection, then there's no power and there's no ability to make a difference. Then he goes on to say, not only is preaching vain, and if preaching is empty without the resurrection, surely our faith is empty without the resurrection. You see, you know what the resurrection validates? Let me give you a list very quickly. The resurrection is the proof, the proof positive that Jesus' suffering on the cross was a vicarious suffering that he took our place. The resurrection validates that he died in our place on the cross. The resurrection validates that his death was our death, that he paid for our sin. The resurrection validates that we have genuine forgiveness of our sins when we ask God to forgive us. Without the resurrection, there would be none of that. The resurrection validates the promises of God. 
One of the most precious parts of the Christian faith is the future, not the past. Yes, the past is important and the resurrection is important, and I'm thankful for all that. But the future's so bright, as Huey Lewis would say in his song, you got to wear shades, right? I mean, the future's bright. The young people are going, Huey, Huey who? <laughs> A singer, okay? Without the resurrection, those promises of, of all that God has in store for us would be vain, they would be empty. Without the resurrection, the resurrection validates our eternal security by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, if he didn't come out of the grave, he's not a savior. If he didn't come out of the grave, he, he's not a living savior that we could pray to today. You see, you know what these false teachers were trying to do? They were trying to put Jesus in the same category of all the other religions in the world. They were trying to put Jesus in the same belief system of all the false deities in the world. These gods and demigods who were supposed to be there, but you could never see or you could never really know. No, Jesus is a Savior that you can see and you can touch and you can talk to. Jesus is a living Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father, and the resurrection validates all of that. And then the worst part, Paul said in his, in his walking them through this hopelessness without the resurrection, he said the worst part is that if Jesus didn't come out of that grave, we're all still in our sins. That's the worst part. Because what's the consequence of being in our sins? It's judgment and doom. Without Jesus coming out of that grave, nobody could be saved. Amen. Without Jesus coming out of that grave, we would all be on our way to hell and life would be pointless. Do you understand a man or a woman who rejects Jesus Christ lives a pointless life, a life with no meaning? Because without being saved by faith in Jesus Christ, it all ends the same way, eternal suffering in hell. You see, it's Jesus who brings life. And unless he came out of that grave, and he is life himself, we have no life. And we're still in our sin. And what's the consequence of sin? Death. Death forever. And so the, the resurrection, Paul's pointing out to them, without it, you are still in your sin. And then he said, even those who have died, thinking they were saved, are hopelessly doomed. Because if Jesus didn't come out of the grave, then they wasted their life believing in something that isn't true. And they're already in hell, and there's no recovery for them. Those who died thinking. And then he said, finally, the utter hopelessness of a Savior who didn't come out of the grave. He said, if, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What's he saying? If our faith goes no further than this life, if the reality of it goes no further than the 80 or 90 years that God gives you here, we are a pitiable bunch. We have nothing. And so Paul brings it to this conclusion and could in essence have said to them, is that, is that what you really believe? Is that what you really think? Is that the hopelessness that Jesus Christ promised when he was here? Absolutely not, which brings us to the glory and the wonderful truth out of that utter disarray of darkness and that path to verse 20. Look at it. He begins that verse with the word but. That means in total contrast to what he was just saying. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. What a glorious statement. But Jesus is resurrected from the dead. In other words, Paul declared he is alive. Here's the glorious truth. Jesus is alive, and he sits at the right hand of the Father right now. He came out of the grave. And when we pray, and when we worship, we worship a living God, not a dead God. Amen. A living Savior, not one who's dead. Some of you will remember 22 years ago now, Nicole C. Mullins sang a song, Redeemer. And in the song, she sings, My Redeemer Lives. It's a pretty magnificent song. And near the end of the song, she ad-libs. And she said, my Redeemer lives, and I know he lives because I talked to him this morning. Man, that's the best part of the song. If you're saved, you could say the same thing, couldn't you? Man, I know Jesus is alive because I talked to him this morning. I don't talk to a dead person. I talk to a God who's alive. And, and listen, he talks back to me. You say, well, does God just speak to you out of heaven? No, he'd probably scare me to death if he did. 
But the Bible says God the Holy Spirit lives in me and lives in all those who are saved. And I can tell you this, the Holy Spirit talks to me all the time. He rebukes me. He encourages me. He convicts me. He gives me conviction about things before I do them. Matter of fact, I, that's one of the things I pray for in the mornings. Lord, how about correct me before I need correcting? Right? You get it? Like, get, you know, move me in the right direction so that I have to come back later and ask for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit does that. And if you're a born-again child of God, God bears witness to you that he's alive and active in your life. That's why no lost person can come to a truly saved person and convince us that we're not saved. Why? Because I have a living Savior that I talk to every day, and he talks to me. And you can't have a conversation with a dead person. So the song and what Paul's saying here is we have a living Savior. He is risen from the dead. I was thinking about the testimony of the Holy Spirit this week, and when I was thinking through that, and, and Paul said this in Romans 8. Listen to what he said to the church at Rome. Beginning of verse 14 of Romans 8, he said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now you get what he's saying right there? If the Holy Spirit's in your life and he's leading you, it's proof that you're saved. It's proof that you're a child of God. In other words, if you have convictions and God's word speaks to you, and you have convictions about life and the Holy Spirit, and you know when the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. It's, it's unmistakable. You can't miss it, Okay. And so Paul said, those who are led by the Spirit, those who have this walking relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, because he lives in you, then you are sons of God. Now listen to what else he says. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. It is the Holy Spirit who lives in us that gives us that relationship, that we cry, Abba, Father, that we have a heavenly Father. And it's in Jesus Christ that we have access to him all the time. And when you as a Christian walk in that, in that uh, trinity circle, man, you're secure and you're confident and your hope stands sure because the evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. And listen to what else Paul said. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. There's your confidence. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The Holy Spirit bearing witness. We walk with him through life. We deal with all the issues of life in the power of the Holy Spirit, all evidence that we belong to him. All that to say we serve a living God. We serve a living Savior, one who came out of the grave. And that's what Paul's saying to them. Now, if you're here this morning or you're watching online or you watch this later via a recording, there's a Savior who's in heaven who loves you right now. And he died for your sin. And he's alive. And he wants to save you. He wants to forgive your sin. He desires to forgive your sin. He loves you. He loved you so much he went to the cross and he died. But he'll only save you if you ask him. He'll only forgive your sin if you'll humble yourself, confess your sin to him, and ask him to save you. People who die without Jesus Christ and go to hell... We'll understand when they get there how easy it would have been to be saved. All you have to do is turn from your sin and ask him to save you. And then you can know the living God who conquers sin and conquered death and he came out of the grave. That's what Paul's saying here. Now notice the rest of verse 20. He said, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Now notice what it says, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits. Now, we talked about this in our life group Bible study last Wednesday, and I'll just recap some of what we talked about last week because not all y'all were in the class. The first fruits comes from, from Leviticus, from the law. They were required, the Jews were, at harvest to bring a first fruits offering to God. In other words, the very first part of the crops that came in, they would bring it to God in, in thankfulness. Now, why would they do that? Because they thank God for the beginning of the crop, and it was an anticipation of the crop that would come. It was an anticipation of the blessing that would come. It was the first part of the blessing. They gave it to God. Now, I don't, I don't want to get off on this too much, but we see a very much 
a, a parallel in the church today. What do we do as God blesses us? We bring the first part of it to God, don't we? We bring an offering. We call it a tithe. You can call it 10%. You can call it what you want. In fact, in the New Testament, it isn't limited to a 10%. It should be in proportion to how God blesses us. So what do we do? God blesses us. We bring a portion of it to him. We give it back to him in anticipation of all that God gives us and all the blessings. Well, the first fruit was what Israel did in Leviticus 23, if you want to go home and read that, okay? Now, what's it mean right here that Jesus is the first fruit? It means that his resurrection, his victory over the grave, his victory over death is the first fruit of everybody who's going to follow him. He's the first of a, listen to me, he's the first of a great host who will follow him. He's the first resurrection of his kind in a resurrection body, and he's the first of everybody who will follow him. Now, who's the everybody? He said here, uh, of all those who are asleep. Now, what does that mean? Well, sleep is a, is a, a metaphor that Paul often used to speak of Christians who had died physically. And so Christians who died, Paul said, they, they aren't dead themselves. Their body is asleep, as it were, waiting for the resurrection, because the moment a Christian dies, what happens to us? We are immediately with Jesus. Now, the body gets left here, and the body gets put in a grave or whatever happens to it, lost at sea, eaten by lions, burned up. It doesn't matter, okay? Because when the resurrection time comes, the God who spoke the universe into existence in one word, he can find all them parts, no problem. And put them all back together and come in a resurrection body, okay? So what he's saying here is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the first fruit of all of us who are going to follow him. All of us who will be resurrected like him and have a body like his. Do you see the importance of the resurrection? Because without the resurrection, none of that would be true. Without the resurrection, we would have no hope. Death would just be death. Man, I look forward to the resurrection one day. I hope Jesus comes while we're alive. You say, well, why? Well, I'm not really thrilled with the whole dying thing. I mean, if it comes, good, all right? I mean, that's okay, because I, I, I trust Jesus. But how cool would it be to be here one moment, and the next moment you got your resurrection body? That'd be the bomb diggity, wouldn't it? I mean, just like, I mean, you're here, and then suddenly you're in your resurrection body, and you're flying up in the air to go meet Jesus with all the resurrected people. That would be good. And so I ask for that. I don't know if it'll happen. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but it'd really be neat if it happened while we were alive. But here's the really good news, the encouraging part about the resurrection. I know in my family, in Moultrie, Georgia, where Mama was from, there's my, my dad, my mom, my granddaddy, my grandmama. Mama had 12 brothers and a sister, so there were, there were 14 of them in a sharecropping family, and a bunch of them were in the same cemetery. Well, I know Grandmama was saved. Man, she loved Jesus. She tried to take 14 kids to church. You think you got trouble getting your kids up to go to church? And, and they were sharecroppers, so they had to like work in the fields. I, I finally figured out why Granddaddy had all them kids. He needed a work crew. I mean, he needed laborers, right? And he didn't pay them. He just fed them. And then they worked in, he was a sharecropper his whole life. And if you don't know what a sharecropper is, you young people, you need to look that up. That's hard work, but that's what he did. But here's the point. They're all, you know, when, when mom and daddy died, we put them in the same, up there with, with her mom and dad and put them in the same, and that's where I was born. But you know what, on resurrection day, be a bunch of empty holes around there. Amen. Gonna be a bunch of people come out there, mom and daddy and grandmama. And I, I don't know if granddaddy was saved. I pray that he was, everything I ever heard. I was a little fellow. Granddaddy was like 92, 93, last time I saw him. Mama said he was a hard man. I don't know if he ever got saved. I pray that he did. But the point is, all them saved people in that graveyard, they're coming out of that, they're coming out of that graveyard. They're coming out of new bodies. And you know why it's possible? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First fruit of all them who are going to follow him. Now, in our, in our last few minutes here, you know what the real crust of the discussion here is for Paul? It's a matter of life and death. That's what it is. It, it just comes down to life and death. You know why? Because 
Sin is in the world, and sin always brings death. And there's death in the world because of sin. And so what Paul's talking about here and what the Bible's talking about is the difference between life and death. And the question is this, do you want to live or do you want to be dead? Do you want life or do you want to continue being spiritually dead and one day die forever and be separated from God forever? What do you want? I don't know about you, but I want life. And that's why I trusted Jesus. I want life, and I want it forever, and I want it with him. Listen to what Paul said. Look at verses 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 15. He said, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Boy, don't get any plainer than that. I mean, it really doesn't. And if, if you, let me just help you in case you're saying, well, I don't really understand what that is. Listen, it's clear. He says here, by man came death. What man? Adam. You see, when God made Adam and put him in the garden and created Eve and put her in the garden with him, there was no sin. Because there was no sin, there was no death. There was no penalty. There was no punishment. There was no separation. They had perfect fellowship with God. But then Adam disobeyed God. And when he sinned, he brought sin in God's perfect creation and he introduced sin into, into perfection. And God had already warned Adam, the day that you sin, you will surely die. And God's good for his word. And death and sin came upon humanity. And everybody who was born after Adam, which is all of us, every human being, is born with a sin nature, born bent away from God. We're born under the curse of sin, which is death. Do you understand that's why death is in the world? That's why people die. That's why we have funerals. That's why we grow old. That's why we have disease. That's why we have sickness because of sin in the world. And the point is, Adam brought that into the world. You say, well, pastor, how do you know we all have this nature? Because I have children. And I have never once in their entire lives had to teach them how to be bad or disobey or be a smart aleck. You know where they get that from? Me. They get it from me, naturally. I was going to say their mama, but I want to go home with her today. <laughs> they get it from me. You know why? Because it's a fallen human nature. And so what do we have to do? By the power of God and his word, we spend our whole lives pointing to Jesus, don't we? We spend our whole lives saying, look, I know how you feel and I know what you want to do, but you can't because it's sin. And we teach them about Jesus and we lead them to get saved. Why? Because we're all broken. We're all broken after the nature of Adam. And it says here, Paul said this, as that sin came by man, so by man was it also corrected. Which man? Capital M, Jesus. Adam, the first Adam, took us into sin. Jesus, the second Adam, took us into life. That's what he's saying here. For as Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. Well, everybody's not just automatically saved when he says all are made alive. All who accept him are made alive. All who are in him are made alive. Why? Because he resurrected from the dead. And you see, if he didn't come out of the grave, none of that would be true. If he didn't come out of the grave, none of it would be possible. So the resurrection and its importance is beyond description. Jesus Christ came out of the grave. Because of that, he can forgive our sins. Because of that, we're adopted into the family of God. Because of that, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Because of that, we have eternal life. You see, the Bible says Adam was disobedient. Philippians 2.8 says Jesus was obedient. There's a difference. Adam, disobedient unto sin. Jesus, obedient unto life, paying for our sin. Let me close with this. Look at verses 23 to 26. Then he gives us the resurrection order. I like this. Real quick, look at it. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, kingdom to God the Father, whom he puts, uh, who, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Now look at verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Amen for that. What Paul said there is this. Because there's a resurrection, because Jesus came out of the grave, there's an order. Jesus the first fruit. When Jesus comes for his church, all who have died in Christ will be resurrected. 
Then all who remain will be changed and we'll meet Jesus in the air and we'll go to be with him forever. Tribulation will begin. God will pour out his judgment on this world. Into the tribulation, Jesus will come back. The battle of Armageddon, he'll come back. Lead the armies of heaven. Destroy the leadership and the world powers. He'll put all power under his authority. He'll put all those false kingdoms down. And he'll deliver up the kingdom, his millennial kingdom, and then into an eternal kingdom to the Father. And he'll rule forever and ever and ever. And we will be resurrected to live with him forever and ever and ever. Now listen, if that's not your hope this morning, you are in a hopeless condition. If that's not your promise this morning, you are in a lost condition. You say, well, pastor, I really don't want to be in a lost condition. I want to be in a saved condition. Jesus is what you need. Jesus Christ. Faith in him. Not religion. Not some Christian function. Not a church function. But you need personal saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul already walked us through the hopelessness of not believing Jesus and not believing in the resurrection. So if you believe the testimony of God's word and the testimony of the Holy Spirit who's dealing with your heart right now, and you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, he'll forgive your sin and he'll save your soul. That's what you need. That's what you need to do. You need to come to Christ today. Would you do that as we pray this morning? Bow your head, pray, ask Jesus to save you right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, for the validity of the resurrection. Thank you, God, for the authenticity of your word for the witness and testimony of men and women who saw Jesus when he came out of that grave. Thank you for the witness and the testimony of God, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, who testifies to us of the reality of our faith. Thank you, God, for the power of your word to change lives. It's not just a book. It's not just some thing written, a religious document, Lord. It's alive and living. And God, those who read it and believe in you, God, have eternal life. Maybe there's somebody here this morning, man or woman, young person, boy or girl, and God, they've never prayed, confessing their sin and asking you to save them. Right now, they can. Right now, in this moment, they can say to you, God, I'm lost and I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I believe Jesus died on that cross for me and paid for my sin and rose again the third day. And by all the faith I have, God, I ask you to save me right now. Forgive my sin, save my soul. God, you have promised to save everybody who will ask. We thank you for that promise and thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing. If I can pray with you or answer any questions, you come on the first verse. I need thee every If you need to talk to somebody, if God's dealing with your heart, you make sure you contact one of us. If you're watching online and you want to talk to somebody, you email us and send us a message and we'll get back to you right away. Love to talk to you about Jesus. Be in prayer for the second service. We have eight baptisms right at the beginning of the next service. Uh, probably going to have a baptism tonight. And we're going to baptize a lady on Easter Sunday morning to begin the service uh, next Sunday, the second service. So be in prayer for that. Folks, if God's been work, you know, through COVID, through all that's been going on, uh, we've still been sharing the gospel, and the church has still been preaching the gospel, and people have gotten saved, and we're going to start baptizing them. As a matter of fact, even uh, the week after Easter, I think there's more baptisms. We have children we're going to baptize that night from the children's ministry in Awana. So uh, God's been good to us. Uh, you continue to share the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. Doesn't matter if they want to listen to you or not. Doesn't matter what they say. Just share the truth with them, okay? And then God will take care of it. They may go home after you share the gospel with them, and they be maybe mad and offended. Then Jesus will get a hold of them. So you just go ahead and, and share it with them, okay? Anything else? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning. We pray your blessing on all that happens here, God, that it honors you and that your name be exalted and you increase and we decrease. Bless your people, Lord. 
this morning with your word. In Jesus' name, amen.